next time. Awesome. So good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all to today's session, which is an online training of trainer session on keep us training in suicide prevention. And uh, today we have with us Dr. Krishna Prasad sir, uh, who is a faculty from NIMHANS. He is currently working as an additional professor of psychiatry at National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences at Bangalore. He has uh, did his MBBS from uh, Bangalore Medical College and MD from uh, National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences. And his areas of interest includes uh, psychiatric, rehabilit uh, psychiatric rehabilitation, emergency psychiatry, and geriatric psychiatry. And sir had been involved with the gatekeeper training program at NIMHANS uh, since 2013. Uh, so I welcome uh, you, sir, uh, for and uh, uh, I thank you for accepting this invitation for training us for this gatekeeper training. And over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Preeti. And uh, I think, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Department of Psychiatry at uh, uh, AIMS Jodhpur for uh, inviting me to share my experience of uh, gatekeeper training for suicide prevention. Uh, I hope I am audible, uh, Dr. Preeti. Yes, sir, you're audible, sir. Yeah, give me a moment uh, while I share my screen. Yes, sir. Is the screen visible? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I would uh, like to start by acknowledging my uh, teachers, uh, uh, Professor uh, Prabha Chandra and uh, Dr. Senthil Kiradi, uh, who have been instrumental in starting this uh, program at uh, NIMHANS way back in 2013. Uh, also with the able assistance of Sister Padmavati. I would also like to acknowledge uh, Professor Pratima Murthy, who is our current uh, director for always being uh, supportive. So uh, to understand the uh, magnitude of the problem of uh, suicide, I think uh, most of you are from the Department of uh, Psychiatry. So you would be aware that uh, nearly around uh, seven to eight lakh uh, people uh, end their lives by uh, suicide uh, in, a, in a year. And uh, for every suicide, there are roughly around uh, 15 uh, suicidal attempts. And uh, if you go by the National Mental Health Survey data around uh, 200 people uh, have uh, suicidal uh, thoughts for every suicide uh, that is completed. So you have a broad range of uh, uh, issues that surround uh, suicide. Looking at people who are at risk for suicide, then you have people who are suicidal and uh, have suicidal thoughts, and then there are attempters, and then of course uh, the uh, major public health problem of uh, suicide itself. Now, the sources of information for uh, uh, as far as uh, suicide is concerned, uh, strangely enough, comes from the National Crime Records uh, Bureau, which uh, officially under the Ministry of uh, Home Affairs records accidents and uh, suicides. So that is a major source of information of uh, uh, recorded information that is available officially uh, to us. There is some information that comes from uh, local community service, but uh, these are either, either uh, regional or uh, very local kind of uh, surveys that provide information. There are some large scale epidemiological studies like the one that uh, looked uh, at suicidal mortality in India in 2012. And more recently, we had uh, Dr. Uh, Raki Dandona and her uh, group publishing the a global burden of diseases study uh, between 1990 and 2016 and looking at the trend and the gender differentials. Then there are um, uh, hospital-based records and quite a few studies that are available and verbal autopsy studies. One a major study from uh, NIMHANS uh, published way back in 2004 that looked at uh, the risk factors for completed uh, suicides, a case control study from Bangalore. So we, we have uh, varied degrees of uh, information from different sources as far as suicide is concerned. But then uh, one needs to keep in mind that uh, there is stigma that is associated with the suicide and also suicidal attempt. Suicide uh, before the passage of the uh, Mental Health Care Act was uh, regarded as a crime. But of course, we now know that uh, there is decriminalization of suicide, yet there are uh, several issues surrounding uh, uh, decriminalization uh, that need to be addressed. So overall, there is gross underreporting of uh, uh, suicide. So even if we look at uh, uh, the number of deaths that uh, the NCRB reports, 
Uh, and even if you look at the studies, there is a significant scope of underreporting that may happen. In many cases, there is a difficulty in determining the intent in the case of uh, deceased, particularly when you're looking at uh, uh, psychological autopsy or verbal autopsy uh, studies. So uh, there is this question of the reliability of statistics. So at the best, it may uh, somewhere uh, give us a near approximate of what may be the uh, real problem. So if you look at the WHO uh, uh, region uh, to which India belongs to, we seem to be having the highest uh, uh, regional, uh, uh, in terms of the regional average, India might be contributing substantively to uh, this. So uh, when compared to say Sri Lanka and uh, the other countries which uh, we are a part of in the WHO region, I think we would be contributing uh, substantively to numbers and our uh, average is uh, substant uh, the suicide death rates are substantively high compared to other countries which are in this region. We know that around 18% of the world's population lives in India and 42% of this population is aged 15 to 39 years. Now, if you look at the contribution of uh, uh, suicide deaths from India to the global suicide deaths, uh, almost one of three women uh, who die of suicide are uh, from India. Similarly, one of four are from India. So uh, when you compare uh, global, uh, uh, the, the ratio of men to women, uh, whereas men are substantively overrepresented in uh, suicides across the world, uh, in India, the ratio of men to women is 1.34. So this uh, differential is actually gradually uh, nearing global trends over the uh, years, but uh, yet one has to be mindful that uh, substantively more number of women end their lives in, uh, through suicide in India. And importantly, it's a leading cause of death in India for those who are aged 15 to 39 years. Uh, and uh, for several years, suicide de death rates are higher in India than the uh, global average. And there is also a substantive regional difference in the uh, suicide rates. We'll come back uh, to that a little later in terms of the southern states having a greater suicide burden compared to several other states. It may be reported to, it may be related to underreporting, but there are several other issues also one needs to be mindful of. This is the latest uh, data from the uh, National Crime Records uh, uh, Bureau. So if you look at it, uh, the All India average is around uh, 12 per lakh uh, population. Uh, if you are looking at Rajasthan, uh, I think it is below the All India average uh, around uh, seven is uh, what is reported in the NCRB. But if you look closely, uh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and uh, Telangana, Chhattisgarh, these are states that have uh, more than 20 uh, as the suicide rate per lakh uh, population. Uh, in terms of the state's contribution to the number of uh, deaths, uh, uh, substantive contributions from uh, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Madhya Pradesh, West Bengal, Karnataka, and Telangana, uh, in terms of the total number of suicide uh, deaths uh, state-wise, if you go by. So uh, all the other st uh, states contribute much less uh, in terms of the number of suicide deaths when compared to these uh, five or six states that substantively contribute to uh, suicide deaths. Now, this is taken from uh, a study uh, published by Dr. Vikram Patel uh, in 2012. And uh, if you look at this uh, data that is available from that time, a large proportion of suicide deaths are uh, because of uh, poisoning. But from the uh, recent NCRB data, it looks like uh, hanging is the most common method of uh, suicide amongst both men and uh, women. Uh, one, in, one important observation is that burns are, uh, the, are substantively more common in women when compared to uh, men. And so though the trend is changing, hanging and poisoning are the two foremost uh, methods of suicide, uh, if you look at the means of suicide. Now, uh, worldwide it is reported that uh, mental illness or uh, depression and, uh, uh, and other uh, severe mental illnesses are commonly related with the uh, suicide. But uh, Indian data suggests that uh, it's more to do with uh, several uh, other issues such as family problems, uh, illnesses which include uh, mental illness, uh, many other issues uh, surrounding marriage, surrounding drug use, surrounding financial issues, uh, surrounding uh, 
failure in examination so all of these substantively contribute to uh, suicide and uh, mental illness possibly as a proximate cause of uh, suicide is uh, uh, far and few when compared to the west so these are some differences that one needs to keep in mind when when you look at uh, uh, suicide uh, in in india vis-a-vis -vis the uh, global uh, data there are several barriers that are existing to suicide prevention uh, as you may be aware, uh, there is uh, high stigma and poor awareness. In general, there is poor awareness about mental health and uh, uh, so much so also about uh, uh, suicide. And then, the, as you very well know, there is uh, skilled resource uh, deficiency and uh, also the scope of problem as far as uh, we are concerned is substantive. And uh, as I mentioned, reliability of information and data is a problem. So who are the key stakeholders is something that we have not very clearly delineated and very clearly uh, identified. And we do not yet have a, a health policy or a strategy that uh, uh, clearly states out what to do with this problem of uh, suicide. And I think the amount of uh, research that has gone into uh, prevention strategies and also uh, that are largely representative of the country are very limited. So these are significant barriers to framing a suicide uh, prevention strategy. Now, we know that the risk for suicide is modulated by a range of factors, both at a population level and also at an individual level. If you look at individual levels, uh, we are looking at uh, proximal factors, which are the most immediate factors or the most uh, imminent ones. And then there are a lot of distal or predisposing factors, and there are some developmental factors which mediate this uh, risk. Now, this is a crowded slide in which, uh, uh, which, which is drawn from an article by uh, Gustavo Tareki and uh, Brent, which talks about uh, what are the distal and predisposing factors, what are the uh, developmental or mediating factors, and what are the proximal or precipitating factors. When we are looking at the causes of suicide, we are mostly looking at uh, proximal or uh, precipitating factors, but we know that suicide in most cases is multifactorial and there are a whole lot of complex issues uh, that are not limited to proximate factors, but also more, uh, more importantly related to social factors, other environmental factors, and several predisposing factors, including family history and uh, genetics. So one needs to be mindful of this when, when we look at uh, suicide uh, prevention. So we know that there are three levels of uh, intervention and prevention as far as the World Health Organization prevention strategies are concerned. So one is to look at a community-based universal prevention uh, method. The other is to look at uh, a vulnerable population. And uh, in the case of suicide, maybe indicated would be those with suicide uh, attempts. So we have to look at uh, strategies that cover all these three areas as far as suicide prevention is uh, concerned. In this context, uh, two recent uh, papers, both uh, authored by uh, Dr. Lakshmi Vijay Kumar, who has been at the forefront uh, urging the uh, country to have a, a suicide prevention strategy because of her work uh, in this area, uh, has recommended that uh, important things that one needs to consider while framing this uh, national strategy are that, uh, I, I mean, things have changed over time, but yet pesticides are a significant uh, issue as far as means of suicide are concerned. So reducing the availability and access to suicide is an important concern that she uh, has asked the government to address. There are other issues surrounding alcohol and uh, drug use, responsible media reporting, promoting and supporting NGOs uh, because the uh, capacity is limited as far as mental health workforce is considered. And there is a need to build the capacity of primary care workers and specialist mental health services. And in this context, there is a need to train uh, gatekeepers. So uh, there is a recent paper that's published in the Lancet that has urged uh, for the framing of a national suicide prevention strategy. And uh, it would be useful to consider uh, the strategies that have been proposed by the authors. Now, India warrants, uh, therefore, prevention strategies at all levels. But uh, we understand there are resource limitations and therefore, we need to look at uh, uh, a broader scope, possibly look at positive mental health and well-being as important constructs in our approach to health and well-being. And we also need to look at uh, a difficult task of intersectoral and trans-sectoral collaborative uh, approach. 
Now, when we look at gatekeeper training for uh, suicide, uh, it, it works on the premise that suicide is preventable. And there is substantive evidence to say that suicide is uh, preventable. And uh, it's also true that many people experience suicidal thoughts during their lifetime, but do not end their life by uh, suicide. Most people who think about suicide are unsure actually about wanting to die. And suicidal thoughts are often intense and uh, severe, but only these are so for a short, brief period and hence uh, can be overcome. So there are some easy to apply techniques which can help overcome these thoughts and urges. This is what we uh, we state to the gatekeepers when we are looking at suicide as a problem. Now, I will share briefly what we have been doing at uh, Nimhans as a part of uh, gatekeeper training program, which we have called as local gatekeeper training program uh, for uh, suicide prevention. Now, the aim of the program that we have been running is to look at uh, uh, the skill development for suicide risk identification, uh, helping these gatekeepers uh, make a risk stratification and also to facilitate some kind of immediate uh, intervention. So basically, we are looking at uh, them providing crisis intervention and then making referrals. Uh, generally, we have been running it uh, as four to eight hour training programs. We have been flexible while uh, we have been looking at the uh, issues surrounding a pandemic and uh, mobility in the last couple of years. So we have even abbreviated it at times, but the primary goal is to look at enhancing knowledge, skills, and uh, building capacity of these uh, gatekeepers. While we were doing this, we have used uh, interactive uh, format with active participation of individuals, which primarily while we are looking at a longer duration course includes role plays, because uh, we feel that uh, skill transfer happens better through role plays and corrective feedback surrounding role plays. We've also used uh, video enabled learning and uh, of course the role plays uh, involve case examples and case vignettes which provide uh, substantive practical uh, examples of uh, real life problems. So the, the usual seven hour module that we have been uh, using uh, covers uh, identification of persons at risk for uh, suicide, assessing suicidal, uh, uh, teaching them how to assess suicidal risk, immediate intervention for suicidality, and uh, very often they require uh, signposting and uh, substantive support after the training uh, in terms of resource mobilization. So we have been running this from the Nimhan Center for Wellbeing. Nimhan's for Center for Nimhan Center for Wellbeing is located outside the Nimhan's campus, and generally caters to people who don't have threshold symptoms. So we thought that that may be a better place to start this uh, program and we have been running it uh, from there. So in terms of the uh, training components, we have uh, looked at uh, clarifying demyst and demystifying uh, the myths and uh, also surrounding suicide and also delinking it uh, primarily from mental illness, as we understand that in India, the contexts are much different when compared to several other countries, particularly those in the West. And uh, the greater emphasis is provided to communication skills. I think uh, th these are most important while we are dealing with a person in distress and who is uh, talking about uh, suicide. We teach them how to approach and engage with the people who are in distress and also uh, help them uh, provide uh, immediate self-help uh, strategies. So uh, there is also uh, a linking somewhere to uh, social support and support-based support uh, problem solving that is provided uh, in the process. So when we train them, we uh, we tell them that the roles that a gatekeeper has is to keep a watchful eye and sound the alarm, uh, provide immediate intervention and re refer clients for further evaluation and treatment. So anybody could be a gatekeeper. So gatekeeper could be somebody who is a teacher. It could be somebody who is a lay counselor. It could be a doctor who is working in primary care. It could be uh, uh, any other professional working at a workplace. So uh, people from different backgrounds actually can enroll themselves in a uh, gatekeeper training program. So we primarily teach them the difference between uh, suicide and uh, self-harm to begin with, uh, in the sense that suicide is an act of ending one's life. It can be planned or impulsive. There are substantive questions surrounding whether it is, uh, I mean, whether most suicides are impulsive. Some begin with the myth that uh, uh, suicides cannot be prevented 
prevented. So clarifying issues surrounding those become very important while we start uh, the discussion around suicide. Many of them have questions surrounding self-harm and uh, whether whether uh, uh, suicidal attempts are a, are a means of seeking attention, how much should they pay uh, attention to when there is uh, uh, this repeated self-harm behavior. So clarifying that self-harm is a coping mechanism and uh, uh, it's more about staying alive than taking one's life, but yet the risk for death cannot be ignored. So these are some things that we do while we are, uh, while we are uh, looking at uh, starting this program. Then we educate them about the warning signs of uh, suicide. Uh, we tell them that warning signs are a cry for help. And usually people uh, show warning signs for days, weeks, and even uh, sometimes up to months. We ask them to look for warning signs and uh, help identify those contemplating uh, suicide. We also tell them that uh, warning signs are those that can be easily identified so that they don't get uh, overwhelmed by psychiatric terminology or the issues surrounding uh, mental health. Uh, warning signs can be missed as they don't appear to be directly related to suicide is something that we emphasize. So we tell them that each warning sign is equally important and cannot be uh, ignored. So some of the warning signs that we uh, discuss with them uh, are both uh, verbal as well as uh, behavioral. So uh, we tell them that people uh, can talk about wanting to die. There could be some others who, who may be looking for a way to kill themselves. And uh, people may be talking about hopelessness and uh, having no reason to live. And these are circumstances when they should uh, talk to this person more and engage with this person uh, uh, in a, in a greater, at a greater length. So uh, people who talk about feeling trapped or those who are in unbearable pain, these are the people with whom they should spend some time to clarify if these are people who are at risk for suicide. And there are people who talk about being burdened to others. So we encourage them to identify uh, these warning signs and uh, probe further. So the, uh, the other warning signs that we ask them to uh, look at are those surrounding the use of alcohol or dr drugs, particularly those people who increase the use of alcohol or drugs in their vicinity, those who act anxious or agitated uh, than uh, their usual self, those who are sleeping too little or too much, those who are being socially isolated and withdrawing uh, themselves, and uh, those who show rage or talk about uh, seeking uh, revenge. So, so these are some warning signs that we uh, discuss with them and uh, clarify their uh, doubts and myths surrounding these uh, warning signs. Mm, one more that I missed was displaying extreme uh, mood swings. So then we move on to what are the risk factors that are associated with uh, suicide. So the, one of the strongest risk factors that is associated with the uh, suicide risk is the previous suicide uh, attempt. So we, uh, we discuss issues surrounding mental disorders. We also talk about substance use disorders. Uh, also, uh, many of them would be aware that uh, uh, suicide can run in families. So there is, the, there is an important factor that needs to be considered as a risk. That is the family history of uh, suicide. Impulsivity is as a trait uh, and other issues surrounding suicide such as relational uh, losses or financial loss, social uh, loss or a work related loss. So these are some risk factors that we discuss with the, uh, with the uh, gatekeepers. So one other important risk factor that we talk to them is about uh, easy access to lethal uh, methods being an important risk factor. The other risk factors that are uh, known to be associated with suicide are chronic physical illnesses and uh, terminal illness. Uh, and of course, uh, as I mentioned already, there is a significant barrier uh, at all levels to accessing mental health treatment. And there is unwillingness to seek help because of uh, stigma. So these are some risk factors that we discuss. There are other issues, uh, for example, the role of media, the role of uh, uh, celebrities, uh, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, inappropriate media representations that can influence uh, the, uh, the, the problem of uh, suicide. There are some cultural and religious beliefs surrounding suicide, which again uh, are brought up in the discussion with uh, them through didactic presentation and discussion, and their doubts are further clarified surrounding this. Uh, when we move further, we talk to them about the, the, the spectrum of uh, suicidality that uh, people may exhibit from simply expressing uh, death wishes, that is uh, passive wishes of uh, being dead and not wishing to live anymore, 
to uh, suicidal uh, ideation with uh, thought out methods of um, uh, methods to kill oneself uh, but those without a specific plan and then those that make a very clear plan of uh, uh, how to uh, end their lives so we ask them to check for uh, preparatory acts like buying pills or giving away things or uh, right, planning to write a suicide note so these are uh, discussed in the discussions with the uh, gatekeepers in the training program uh asking while last while checking on the suicidal attempt we asked them to check on the intent and uh, lethality of the last suicidal uh, attempt and help them identify uh, issues surrounding both intent and uh, lethality sometimes it may become very difficult for gatekeepers to these are more clinical rather than um, uh, it's easier to to teach uh, mental health professionals rather than gatekeepers uh, these issues uh, we use an acronym for them to uh, remember the uh, the various uh, issues that need to be covered while doing the uh, assessment of uh, suicide risk which includes ideation substance use uh, purposelessness anxiety being trapped hopelessness withdrawal uh, anger and agitation recklessness mood change and swings we have borrowed this from the american association for suicide suicidology and uh, many of our uh, participants have felt that this is a very easy way for them to uh, remember uh, the issue surrounding warning signs and risk factors one important issue uh, while uh, looking at uh, uh, their training is that many of them have challenges in asking the uh, suicide uh, question and uh, early on in our training too i think we would have felt uh, some degree of discomfort or difficulty in asking this uh, suicide question timing it appropriately uh, well into the uh, interview and uh, checking with them uh, the suicide uh, question becomes a challenge for many so uh, we teach them that there is no perfect way of asking uh, this question but yet uh, normalizing questions seem to make the other person comfortable than direct or indirect uh, questions so some examples of indirect questions uh, uh, are discussed for example the uh, the questions that are put up in the slide here like do you feel like harming yourself could be an indirect uh, question similarly a direct question could be as uh, direct as have you been thinking of killing yourself but uh, what uh, we know is that uh, people become comfortable when uh, we tell them that uh, people who are feeling disturbed they think of uh, suicide uh, sometimes and is this uh, something that uh, you are thinking so uh, asking it in this manner possibly uh, will make the other person comfortable so usually most uh, participants come around to understand that a normalizing uh, question seems a little more comfortable uh, to ask to a person who is in distress we also provide some uh, tips particularly people may be short of time they may not uh, feel comfortable uh, in asking uh, questions surrounding suicide so we tell them that if you have a doubt don't wait but uh, simply ask uh, the question directly uh, if sometimes the other person is guarded or reluctant we ask them to be persistent uh, um, i mean being gently so we also uh, tell them that uh, talking to a person in distress is always better done in a private setting and not uh, to be done in a uh, in a public setting or where a large number of people are around uh, we tell them that they need to give a lot of time to uh, to do this because it can't be possibly done in a hurry and we allow the person to ask the person to talk freely mm, we tell them that they need to check the frequency of thoughts whether these thoughts are fleeting or uh, fixed we also discuss uh, protective factors and uh, we tell them that uh, protective factors uh, are uh, supportive families friends obligations towards them stable interpersonal relationships uh, access to psychological or mental help absence of mental disorders and there are some uh, cultures and religious beliefs that discourage suicide so all of these factors are discussed in the uh, training program so uh, if somebody has a suicidal plan we ask them to uh, discuss the uh, details surrounding the plan like when are they planning to do it where are they planning to do it how are they planning to do it and the methods that the person is uh, planning to use and uh, reasons to live so if the person has some protective factors to even look at the protective factors as to what are the factors that stop this person from acting on these uh, thoughts so far the core principles underlying this are uh respect and uh, genuineness and uh, warmth uh, and a sense of understanding uh, um, of the context of the discussion there are uh, some uh, issues surrounding being 
judgmental or non-judgmental. We teach them how to be non-judgmental in the role plays. And uh, one important component uh, is uh, active uh, listening. So some of these uh, counseling skills, uh, which are general counseling skills, uh, we train them through the use of uh, role plays and video-based uh, training. Uh, that is including uh, normalizing, uh, how to ask the normalizing questions, how to do reflective uh, questioning. So these are some, some skills that are better imparted through uh, hands-on training while uh, uh, doing the real role play. So uh, uh, people are afraid often to ask about feelings. And uh, so this is something that we encourage them to ask uh, in the role play because uh, we know that uh, it's very challenging to ask about uh, feelings. So we tell them that many people at uh, some time in their lives think about suicide and most decide to live because they eventually come to realize that the crisis is temporary and death is uh, permanent. On the other hand, people having a crisis sometimes perceive their dilemma as uh, inescapable and feel an utter loss of control. So these are some of the feelings and things they experience. They can't stop the pain. Sometimes they say they can't think clearly. They can't make decisions, can't see any way out, can't sleep, eat or work. So all of these provide some avenue of uh, uh, approaching uh, feelings surrounding the uh, distress. So these are some uh, acronyms which we have put up to, uh, uh, to cover the areas that are a part of the uh, assessment and intervention. So we tell them to focus on the person. We ask them to encourage uh, free communication. Uh, one important component is to listen attentively, express concerns and uh, uh, understanding of the person's problem. We uh, ask them to give adequate time to a person uh, and to approach a person in distress with respect, show care when uh, inquiring and not uh, demean or uh, disrespect the person's uh, distress and concerns. Uh, ask them to find a space to offer privacy, uh, help them uh, be uh, understand the problem and importantly the person as a whole empathy and non-judgmental uh, viewpoints are uh, important uh, parts of the uh, intervention so some directive tips that we provide for them uh, are to be direct and talk openly and matter of factly about suicide sometimes uh, to beginners it becomes a little challenging to do this uh, be willing to listen allow expression of feelings accept the feelings be non-judgmental, don't debate whether suicide is right or wrong. While training, we have found that uh, many of them have this uh, notion of uh, initially starting off uh, by uh, being preachy and saying that uh, this is right or this is wrong. Do not lecture on the value of life. Uh, be available, show interest, don't dare the person. Sometimes we have seen participants uh, while doing the role play dare or ask them to uh, uh, show whether they are able to do it. So don't act shocked. Sometimes uh, these are emotions that uh, can be difficult for a therapist even to handle, but uh, these are, remember, sometimes uh, lay community uh, people. So they may suddenly get shocked when uh, issues surrounding suicide come across them. Uh, don't be sworn to secrecy. So we also clarify doubts surrounding confidentiality and uh, seeking support when there is uh, somebody who is in uh, severe distress. Offering hope is something that is an important component of the intervention is what we emphasize. Uh, and also making a safety plan for somebody who is at very high risk until the person reaches uh, uh, medical treatment. For example, one of the methods could be to keep uh, constant vigil on the person, remove all the means, possible means that are available to the person. So uh, these are some things that are provided in terms of practical tips. We also tell them that uh, there are uh, mental health agencies, there are private psychiatrists. We give them a, a list of resources that they can avail uh, locally in terms of uh, treatment as far as mental health is concerned. So uh, some other strategies which are important in this context uh, that we discuss with them are uh, teaching them how to uh, engage with the uh, people who are in distress to promise not to act on suicidal thoughts, knowing very well that suicide-related uh, behavioral contracts can be broken, but yet this is one more, uh, one more method of delaying uh, and postponing. So uh, also we tell them that to encourage people who are at risk to uh, engage in hobbies that provide pleasure, start looking at physical and mental activity to distract themselves, uh, staying close to people who are near and dear to them, 
engaging uh, in task uh, in any task or work with others so that they have some degree of support available to them we ask them to tell the uh, person in distress to look for someone to share their concerns we also provide a list of helplines to these people and uh, uh, ask them to uh, do a follow up and uh, take support and of course uh, we ask them to tell the other person to trust oneself to overcome this uh, uh, passing phase so we provide a list of examples of who are the people who are at low risk moderate risk and high risk and uh, give them some examples and these are usually from uh, uh, from uh, evidence and uh, we also exemplify by using uh, role plays mm, we have been uh, doing this uh, program since 2013 february and uh, we have trained more than 6000 people so far in the community and Uh, we have included uh, phc doctors psychologists nurses social workers and even asha workers in some places and uh, we have worked with some uh, state governments like chatisgarh and uh, uh, sikkim we also worked with the media personnel uh, lay counselors uh, uh, then police personnel defense personnel and uh, prison staff there are also some academic uh, institutions with whom uh, we have uh, done the gatekeeper training program so these are some photographs of the program that we have done so uh, several government organizations also have been a part of it uh, so thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to share uh, our experience as far as gatekeeper training is concerned we uh, released a book last year uh, on the same day uh, which is basically a practical guide for primary health care workers as far as uh, uh, suicide prevention is concerned so thank you again for the opportunity uh, now i'm open to uh, questions thank you ramesh sir uh, so now i would like to invite questions from the residents you can just unmute yourself and uh, ask questions or you can type in the chat box also time others uh, just uh, i mean think about the questions uh, so it was a very wonderful presentation it actually like uh, gives us an idea on how we can also conduct uh, gate for training for uh, the future uh, uh, people so like what is the target audience you will uh, i mean you usually keep so no uh, usually uh, while we have been doing uh, role plays we have limited it to 20 because we find that if it is more than that uh, it's hard to uh, impart skills related to this but uh, during the covid period we have had online uh, uh, sessions as well but we found it a little challenging uh, while doing it uh, online so we prefer it in person and uh, uh, we usually prefer it to be a 4 to 6 hour uh, program when we do it okay uh, so and uh, do we have a homogeneous kind of a of the audience like uh, if you are uh, taking parents we take only parents or we have a mixer kind of uh, audience usually uh see for example uh, we've had uh, uh universities who have come and uh, there are peer volunteers who are willing to be gatekeepers in their respective colleges or uh, uh, schools so uh, with them we have done it's it's a rather homogeneous uh, population then there are sometimes uh, uh, when we have had uh, uh, programs at the center for well being where we've had a mixed uh, group uh, like the last one that we had a couple of weeks back we had uh, uh, doctors we had lay counselors we had college students so it's a mixed uh, group sometimes it's a little uh, challenging then but uh, i think uh, uh, that kind of diversity also provides an opportunity to uh, provide a perspective uh, across uh, different uh, issues to uh, these people so there are advantages and disadvantages of doing uh, uh, either ways uh, so dr harsh has asked a question Uh, yeah. is there any interventions or modifications for people with poor social support in gatekeeper approach uh we we basically train uh people who are um, uh, say in a workplace or say in a 
स्कूल और से इन द कम्युनिटी इन जनरल इट कुड बी हेल्थ वर्कर इवन हु कुड आइडेंटिफाई पीपल हु आर इन डिस्ट्रेस चेक विद एम इफ दे आर सोइसाइडल इफ दे आर सोइसाइडल मेक अ रिस्क असेसमेंट इन टर्म्स ऑफ वेदर दे आर लो मॉडरेट हाई वॉट टू डू एन समबडी इज हैविंग अ लो रिस्क वॉट टू डू एन समबडी इज हैविंग अ हाई रिस्क so it is quite possible that in some of these instances they may not be willing to take social uh, support either because of stigma or maybe they may be having issues surrounding relationship which they do not wish to share with others so it becomes sometimes a challenge for them to mobilize uh, uh, social support at that point of time so there are certain situations when obviously they might need to these gatekeepers might need to uh, break confidentiality and inform the Uh, family members when particularly when the risk is high and there may be rare circumstances when uh, police or other law enforcement agencies might need to be mobilized i think there is uh, some degree of anxiety that they will have around these so you will have to address uh, all of these when you do, when you deal with uh, these issues thank you sir so- sir nice presentation so i have few questions like one is uh, what is your experience regarding one time training session versus some booster sessions in the some period yeah. of time yeah so uh, i think your question is very pertinent because uh, uh, of course uh, one issue surrounding gatekeeper training program when we are looking at gatekeeper training program it cannot be looked at in uh, isolation and uh, how much is its impact in terms of uh, outcomes in terms of suicide itself is something that we really don't know so it's not a, a very strong evidence that uh, works out in favor of gatekeeper uh, uh, training uh, so having said that uh, uh, booster sessions are likely to be useful but they are likely to be useful uh, as far as evidence is concerned only as much as to increase the knowledge and skills of these participants but in terms of suicide rates we really don't have enough data to say if uh, gatekeeper training program by itself and it's unlikely that uh, we will know uh, this uh, even with the best amount of our efforts to see if um, uh, gatekeeper training by itself uh, would be uh, something that would make uh, i mean we would not be able to gather that evidence to say that uh, so gatekeeper training by itself is sufficient to bring down rates but of course we know that it is one of the uh, one of the measures as a part of a uh, prevention strategy that can be considered as far as uh, suicide is concerned so booster sessions are likely to be useful we have had uh, advanced sessions with people we also have uh, provided uh, follow along support uh, to uh, quite a few organizations particularly when they have had um, a practical issues surrounding uh, a person with whom uh, they have found it difficult to engage so um, the uh, the the staff at uh, center for well being uh has uh, been supportive to them in terms of uh, guiding them in difficult circumstances when they have been provided uh, a phone line to call thank you sir and by what means you are connected with all the gatekeepers that were trained by your institute yeah so we have, we have maintained the directory of the people that we have uh, trained and uh, they are usually on uh, touch with us through email or uh, uh, phone and as i mentioned there are some challenges sometimes they lose people around them and uh, they themselves uh, require some degree of support and uh, uh, there are people who feel significantly guilty of not having intervened or not having done sufficiently so some degree of support for them is also uh, something that we make available for people who come from away it becomes a little challenging uh, to uh, to provide this kind of support but at least those who can call us and who can uh, who have the wherewithal to approach us i think we have been able to help them okay sir thank you thank you sir there is another question by dr danishri uh, how to deal with children with suicidal ideations and whose uh, whose parents are also not accepting it and stigma associated with it uh uh yeah it's true but i think as um, since we are talking about gatekeepers i think we should ask uh, the school is an opportunity to uh, to train gatekeepers so many schools have counselors many schools do not have counselors teachers can be empowered uh, to be gatekeepers yes uh, as a group i think they are a challenge uh, clinically i agree Uh, sir again uh, dr puneet uh, has asked a question about i want to ask about the way how to involve the parents or friends of a patient when he or she does not want to involve them without offending the patient's privacy yeah it's challenging sometimes to deal with uh, privacy related issues so we 
uh, tell them as to what may be the diff- different circumstances when uh, this may become an issue. And it's quite likely that sometimes, uh, as I mentioned, you may need to break uh, confidentiality if you are uh, seeing the person at uh, high risk. So definitely it's an issue. I think it's an important uh, concern. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, Dr. Pinky has mentioned it was a very nice presentation. And uh, he has mentioned that as a clinician, what should be done in a case uh, when someone calls and says that he or she is going to commit suicide? Yeah, I think uh, there are, uh, I mean, most of us would have had uh, this clinical experience. So what works possibly ideally is the rescue that is associated. This could happen even with the helpline, isn't it? So where uh, people call and say that uh, they are suicidal. So what usually happens is to uh, look at what are what all are the risk factors with this person, what is the risk uh, uh, stratification that you're looking at, what immediately can you provide over phone in terms of uh, uh, the d- different strategies that I discussed, engaging with the person and helping him postpone this uh, decision uh, is something that can be done. There are circumstances where you might need to take the help of your colleagues and might need to look at a, a rescue mission sometimes, particularly when the risk is very Hi, the fact that the the person is calling you indicates to you also that this person also is somewhere looking at life as an option and not simply looking at uh, uh, death as an option. So um, I think uh, this provides an opportunity for you to intervene. Uh, It could be in the form of uh, asking the person himself to seek uh, uh, help from friends or near and dear ones to uh, sometimes even looking at uh, the police if you can make a phone call in the immediate vicinity to provide uh, support. So there are some rare circumstances when this can be done. For example, I had a phone call while I was working in Ames Bhopal uh, saying that uh, uh, I am near a railway line and uh, uh, I am planning to uh, commit suicide here. So uh, what uh, practically we did was we engaged with this person. I asked my clinical psychologist to engage while I spoke to the railway police since I knew the Habib Ganj uh, railway police station there. So I called the Habib Ganj uh, railway police and then we uh, somehow were able to get the person out of there. So those may be rare circumstances, but of course, uh, these are practical difficulties that one has to sometimes innovatively look at what uh, means you can use to rescue somebody. There may be some sometimes legal issues surrounding those. So you'll have to be a little careful of uh, uh, dealing with those as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Anand has asked, as per your experience, which age group is more affected? From literature, we know that uh, uh, at least uh, a good number of uh, people from the productive age group, 15 to 39, uh, is something that is uh, um, uh, affected substantively in terms of numbers. Uh, We are also seeing a lot of elderly uh, suicide uh, now, uh, particularly in men. So these are two important age groups that uh, one needs to consider. Children are also vulnerable, but uh, I think literature would say that 15 to 39 contributes to a substantive number. In terms of people who come for training, for gatekeeper uh, training, uh, we have seen a wide age range uh, from um, people who are in college to sometimes people who are uh, retired and would want to do some kind of uh, social service. So we see a wide uh, age range as far as uh, people who seek training uh, and come to us. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Charul has asked the question, what should be our approach in making safety plan in a psychotic patient who is having suicidal thoughts? Yeah, so I think, um, uh, uh, I mean, the the circumstances of a gatekeeper finding somebody uh, psychotic would be either in a health setting or sometimes in the home setting and very, very rarely in a workplace uh, related uh, setting. I think it uh, becomes difficult to engage if somebody is really very uh, aggressive, violent, or if the person is uh, too distressed because of the psychotic experiences. I, and I think there will be a lot of hesitancy also uh, in terms of this uh, colleague or a superior or a, or a person in the vicinity to deal with this uh, psychotic uh, person. So we encourage them to seek uh, uh, and seek help and mobilize resources around them to uh, take this person for uh, treatment. So as a gatekeeper, I think it becomes difficult for them to treat psychosis or to manage psychosis. So I think they should uh, only signpost and uh, possibly uh, provide the person an opportunity avenue of treatment. I think that's the only thing that is uh, possible. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I have one question. Like, uh, uh, have you ever come across the gatekeepers? Like, uh, even after, despite their uh, efforts uh, in a person at high risk of suicide, uh, they had committed suicide and then they feel the distress and guilt that they have not been able to manage. And how do you address this while uh, we are doing the gatekeeper training? Yeah, so I think uh, many of them uh, we have noticed. Uh, even while training, they have, uh, while discussing surround, issues surrounding suicide, they have broken down and they have uh, um, either lost somebody near and dear to them and that's why they are coming to the program. Sometimes some, some of them have been working as lay counselors and they have lost somebody whom they have been uh, looking at as uh, people whom they have counseled. So uh, we do uh, see these kind of people also uh, attend the uh, gatekeeper uh, program. And uh, of course, uh, the issues surrounding each of them would be distinct. And uh, we, dis we discuss with them the circumstances, sometimes either uh, after the program on the same day, or we, see we ask them if uh, they need some degree of support uh, following that in terms of dealing with the feelings surrounding the loss, in terms of... Uh, uh, their own uh, um, uh, issues, personal issues uh, surrounding the loss. Uh, sometimes some of them may themselves have uh, risk factors. Uh, so these are some things that uh, we do with them uh, when uh, we find, identify such issues, Dr. Preeti. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, do we, uh, I mean, uh, while we are recruiting or when, uh, when a person is approaching for gatekeeper training, do we have certain criteria based on which we decide that this person may not be eligible for the gatekeeper training? Usually you're not uh, excluded anybody, but uh, of course, when uh, it is in a run in a group, uh, sometimes uh, some of them can be dominating. Some of them can um, uh, can be uh, uh, talking too much. Some of them may not talk even. Uh, as I mentioned, some of them may uh, break down. Uh, so there are some challenges which can happen in a group uh, format. So those uh, definitely are there, but we have generally not uh, excluded uh, people uh, based on any criteria. Uh, Dr. Mukesh has asked the question, is there any difference in gatekeeper training provided to health professional versus layman? Uh, yes, I think uh, literature will say that uh, community gatekeeper training is slightly uh, different from um, health worker related uh, training. Uh, of course, the, uh, the amount of simplification that may be uh, required uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe uh, different when you compare the two uh, groups, but overall, I think the risk factors and uh, the the warning signs are almost uh, similar. So, and uh, general mental health awareness, even among uh, health workers, is not uh, not great. So, considering that, I think uh, uh, in our setting, at least the differences are not uh, much. Of course, uh, uh, issues surrounding. Uh, intent, uh, lethality, these are concepts that may be better known to a, a health worker, but uh, not so much to a lay person. And uh, even so, counseling skills, uh, sometimes we see uh, the, the, uh, there are experiences where uh, lay people are better equipped uh, at listening and active listening than uh, people uh, who are uh, in the health field. Thank you, sir. And one last question by Dr. Naveen. What will, the, what will be the role of gatekeepers in intervention? So the primary role is, I think, uh, uh, actively listening to the person, making a safety plan, and uh, providing some degree of hope to the person, and making the person postpone the decision. And finally, and most importantly, when the risk is moderate or high, to uh, refer the person and ensure that this referral uh, loop is closed. So the person actually reaches the, uh, reaches the mental health professional uh, or, a, or, a, uh, or either a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist so that uh, the person's issues can be dealt with. So that's when the risk is high. So make a safety plan and do that. Thank you, sir. Any other queries or questions? Uh, so one query from my side again. Uh, so if we consider like uh, uh, our institute or any institute, so do you think that uh, there should be a gatekeeper training in which we uh, take in one person from each department or it should be predominantly voluntary basis? Like uh, Because we find that there are a lot of distress among many of the students and residents. Uh, uh, especially I, uh, yeah, I think it's very important uh, question that you raised. Uh, for example, while working with the, the defense personnel, we have found that uh, hierarchy is a very important uh, barrier 
to uh, reaching out so um, uh, so i think it's a major uh, barrier so peers there are some defense forces which have a buddy system so uh, where uh, peers are uh, uh, somewhere available uh, for them so an important strategy would be to be mindful of the context in which uh, you are talking uh, about this uh keeping in mind the the systems that are there in terms of hierarchy the availability of uh, uh, resources so i think be mindful of that while you are designing uh, uh, this so i think one needs to be cognizant of this uh, uh, factor so having said that i think to begin with the uh, voluntary basis would uh, be a better approach because then people are inclined towards helping and those could uh, serve as exemplars for others to uh, to volunteer themselves uh, in the program and some of them are naturally inclined they are psychologically minded they are open to uh, talking about uh, mental health issues don't have uh, as much uh, stigma some are uh, non judgmental and uh, want to be engaged in some kind of social um, engagement or service so those are kind of people who are likely to be inclined and take it up thank you so much sir uh, any other queries or comments from the Uh, ஒரு Are you able to hear Dr. Preeti? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Krishna. I'm sorry for the network issue. I was stuck in another schedule in nearby university on uh, suicide prevention initiatives. And uh, I would just like to ask, uh, what about your general frequency with which you organize such programs, gatekeeper trainings? uh we have been um, uh inviting uh, the um, uh, the the participants to join us once a month pre covid but uh, post covid i think uh, we have been a little less frequent uh, i think we are going to again come back to once a month soon enough thank you and second query uh, from my side since you are maintaining the registry about the gatekeeper so are you able to get that the majority people who have been in touch with gatekeeper training uh, gatekeepers they are reaching to some health service for the later part of the treatment yes so we do have a, a good number of people who uh, reach out to um, uh, mental health services we actually provide them uh, details of uh, there is a directory is both of uh, uh, psychologists uh, psychiatrists that is available with us which we provide uh to them in case of a need so i think that becomes an important component because they should know locally whom to uh, refer to some of them uh, by themselves are knowledgeable but uh, there are few who require some degree of support we also provide them a list of uh, helplines uh, that we are aware of uh, but uh, i think that requires periodic updating because several circumstances we have realized that uh, some of these helplines are short short term temporarily run so i think that requires some degree of work one other bit which i didn't add is that uh, we've looked at uh, uh, look, looked at uh, how much they are able to learn in terms of knowledge skills and uh, preparedness so i think we have inbuilt that into the uh, training also to understand uh, how much they are gaining and uh, how much they are uh, learning in terms of the skills that are necessary thank you very much uh, we'll be continuing to use uh, this support and uh, because yes the resources and services are reasonably less to address this issue so in that way you and entire team will be very resourceful for us thank you very much to you for taking up time out for this presentation and thanks to dr tanu and dr preeti
for taking this initiative. Dr. Preeti, please. Uh, sir, one more last query from my side. Uh, sir, uh, do you uh, also give any kind of an incentive or uh, some reward for uh, some gatekeepers who are doing uh, really well? No, uh, I think, uh, in fact, uh, uh, it's paid the other way around. So uh, there's good good amount of demand, but uh, the fact that we are all clinically engaged uh, precludes us uh, from conducting this very uh, frequently. So, in fact, there was a demand for it to be done uh, today even, but I think uh, uh, there are substantive challenges for faculty and uh, other resource persons to be uh, available. Uh, having said that, uh, when we have done it in the community as a part of uh, mental health program, the, the, uh, there are some taluks where, uh, and uh, while doing with the Chhattisgarh government, uh, there has been demand, particularly from health workers, that uh, incentivizing is something that needs to be considered because they are uh, inundated with several programs and issues to deal with. So incentivizing probably is a me method of ensuring that uh, this will be taken, out, taken up with uh, some degree of interest. Uh, but I don't know whether, uh, uh, I mean, the, the outcomes are so distant. Uh, so whether the incentives are measurable, I mean, the, the, when they are giving the incentives, whether these outcomes are measurable in tangible terms uh, for them to be given. So I think that's a challenge. Yeah, Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so any other queries or comments? If none, I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Krishna Prasad, sir, for such a beautiful elaborative session. Uh, it has clarified many of our doubts and uh, we believe that uh, we will continue to be in touch with you and your team for uh, uh, further strengthening uh, our knowledge on this gatekeeper training. Uh, Narissa, would you like to conclude? Yeah, thank you. Is it audible, Dr. Preeti? It's, it's audible. Yeah, yeah. Answering uh, on this last part, because here this is internal incentive works. So anyone works in this area, they uh, may not need any incentives, but just some support system. And again, in that way, I would say there should be some more thought that we all mental health professionals also need some support while dealing with such patients and especially while losing one or other patient. So uh, if such initiatives are existing, uh, Dr. Krishna, please uh, let us know because that so, we understand that's a gap. Yeah, no, I, in, in, in fact, uh, Dr. Naresh, uh, there are what are called as balanced groups which uh, run. Um, they are uh, run in um, the UK uh, for uh, sure. But uh, here even, um, I, for example, I'm a part of one where uh, we can discuss difficult uh, cases with colleagues and uh, uh, superiors. We can bring up issues, including uh, those surrounding... Uh, uh, suicide, those surrounding difficult patients, uh, clinical challenges, so that, so that there is some degree of peer supervision. Uh, but uh, uh, the, what I have found is that uh, we found it difficult to join, though there is a, a day scheduled every Wednesday to discuss this. Uh, but I think uh, uh, because of uh, compelling reasons of uh, finding time for this, so being uh, Attending this regularly has been a challenge for me, but I think uh, such uh, support groups for professionals uh, uh, in terms of clinical uh, oversight and supervision is also something that uh, may be useful, Dr. Narish. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we met first in 2013, centralized interviews for all new aims, and uh, Dr. Krishna remained very active in all the endeavors, and thank you very much for keeping this human uh, area uh, for uh, work because yes it's the most preventable cause of death and in a way we can prevent definitely better with better knowledge thank you very much uh, dr krishna and entire team of yours who is working for this human task and we'll we all are grateful to you and the team for delivering on this area thank you thank you dr naresh and i think i would like to thank all of you uh, in particular dr naresh dr preeti dr mukesh i think uh, for uh, inviting me and uh, allowing me to present uh, our experience. It's been uh, teamwork and I think uh, it was started in 2013 by Dr. Prabha and uh, while I was doing my uh, fellowship here. So I think it's uh, uh, there's substantive demand for it. There's good amount of demand uh, and a lot of organizations uh, reach out because it's a need that they feel uh, is important. Thank you once again for the opportunity. Thank you.